The Rhine, April 1734. It's the War of Polish Succession, and Frederick, Crown Prince of Prussia, is trying to be the man his father wants him to be. Though court-martialed after his attempted escape to England, he's been restored to military rank in order to gain battlefield experience. But this is not how you run an army. Frederick is embedded with the forces of the Holy Roman Empire, confronting the French under the famed general, Prince Eugene of Savoy. Yet Eugene is a fated hero. He can pass wisdom and experience to Frederick, sure, but he's also 70, frail, and can barely remember his last conversation. He's cautious and defensive, afraid to act. His body was still there, Frederick later observed, but his soul had gone. And the Imperial Army? Well, it was weak, disorganized, and fractious. I could defeat this enemy, Frederick muses, and he would get his chance. For this terrorized prince was about to start a fire that would burn through Europe and the world. Say, would you happen to want to watch the next episode of this series immediately after watching this one instead of having to wait a full week? Well, now with the new Nebula first, you totally can. Learn how to get access to the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle after the episode. At the end of last week's episode, Frederick decided to play the role of the dutiful son. And, you know, wait until his ill father died. He submitted to a new regime of tutors that focused on making him masculine, agreed to marry a woman he detested, and went to war. But a strange thing happened. Frederick actually became a pretty good soldier. As colonel of a regiment, he developed a fascination with strategy, battlefield tactics, and leadership. And while he never truly saw any action during the War of Polish Succession, he acquitted himself honorably. When he returned, his father Frederick William, now confined to a wheelchair by gout, reconciled with his son. Proud of Frederick's progress, he gave him a lakeside castle, where he could indulge in artistic pursuits in private. Frederick and his wife, Elizabeth Christine, moved in though in truth he largely kept clear of her. There, he read books, staged plays with friends, played the flute, set up a regular discussion group on military strategy, and recruited architects to expand his new home. It was the happiest time of his life, though he was clandestinely doing something else as well, preparing to become king. See, some of those architects started quietly taking trips on his dime, studying opera houses in Italy and France. He also immersed himself in philosophical writing, producing his first book, The Anti-Machiavel, an idealistic refusion of Machiavelli's The Prince. In the book, Frederick argues in favor of an enlightened absolutist monarch who would provide a moral example to his people and keep them healthy and happy. He then sent the manuscript to the French philosopher Voltaire, who edited it and prepared it for anonymous publication, though his identity did leak immediately. It would eventually become a bestseller, with readers hoping to gain a window into Frederick's mind. And perhaps the greatest insights could be found in a section on the type of wars he considered just. It contains some of the things you'd expect, such as defensive wars or wars of last resort, but also what Frederick called wars of interest. In such a war, a king realizes an enemy is going to declare war on him in the future and preemptively attacks them in order to gain the greatest military advantage. Huh, was Frederick already considering the moves he'd make during his reign? Well, it's possible. Though by this time, he had become adept at keeping people at a distance, hiding behind a series of masks and personas that sometimes contradicted one another. And more often than not, he adopted the part of a misanthropic loner. Some historians see this as a survival tactic, a response to trauma, and an attempt to hide his sexuality. But it did mean that even for close friends and ministers, it was really difficult to get inside Frederick's head. So it's hard to say exactly how Frederick felt in May of 1740, when he got word that his father was dying. Rushing to the palace in Berlin, they had time for one last talk. And it turned out that while opposite on all else, their political ambitions aligned. Both dreamed of uniting the scattered territories of Brandenburg, Prussia, currently sprinkled through the Holy Roman Empire or embedded with Poland, and both thought their kingdom could be one of the great nations of Europe. Then, on March 31st, 1740, Frederick William died in the arms of the son he'd tormented. But Frederick wasn't left alone. For now, he had the most efficient bureaucracy in Europe, an unmatched recruitment system, an army of 80,000, and an enormous war chest of funds, an amount his father had amassed by avoiding foreign wars. The soldier king had, ironically, relied chiefly on clever diplomacy and never fully used the army he'd built. King Frederick II, however, would. But first, some fun. Frederick's immediate move after his father's death was to build an opera house. 
He wanted to invest in the arts and sciences, which, ironically enough, his father had defunded so badly that they actually had to borrow soloists from Saxony to sing at his funeral. Next up, no longer requiring a wife to mollify his father, Frederick sent poor Elizabeth Christine to a palace outside Berlin. She wasn't even invited to his coronation. Instead, he brought an Italian philosopher who was likely his lover, and the pair followed it up with a foreign trip together where they met Voltaire. Then, with all of that out of the way, Frederick prepared for a war of interest. October 20th, 1740, Vienna. Charles VI, Holy Roman Emperor and sovereign of the Habsburg Dominions, is dead. All his life, Charles had been terrified that he would only have daughters, and because the laws of the Habsburg Dominion said women could not inherit, his scattered territories would fragment in a succession crisis when he died. To prevent this, he'd issued the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713, declaring that a woman could inherit the Habsburg lands, and he spent most of his reign trying to get his neighbors to agree to it. Good thing, too, since his daughter Maria Theresa proved his most viable heir. Ironically, a woman Frederick tried to marry when he was searching for a bride. Now that'd be an alternate history novel worth reading. Charles had essentially bankrupted Austria in trying to bribe the great states into accepting the Pragmatic Sanction, a document they immediately backed off of as soon as he was dead. Austria's military was also weakened from a series of major wars, meaning the vultures were circling, seeing what they could pick off the Habsburg corpse. Of course, Austria also had something Frederick wanted, Silesia a province that made up a third of Austrian revenue and sat right across the border from Brandenburg. But Frederick needed to make his move soon, way too long, and Saxony might take Silesia first, blocking Prussian expansion south. In six weeks, lightning speed in 18th century standards, Frederick had mobilized his army and crossed the border into Silesia. It was so easy at first, so much so, that he could not have imagined that this act would set in motion a chain of events that would bring bloodshed not just to Central Europe, but to places as far away as Senegal, Brazil, India, and the Philippines. The First Silesian War and the War of Austrian Succession had begun. Prussian forces were practically unopposed, sweeping up the lightly defended province and taking forts. But Maria Theresa, who would become Frederick's lifelong rival, raised an army and began to oppose him. And so, Frederick II fought in his first battle. Mulwitz, April 10th, 1741. As the Austrian cavalry comes at his right flank, Frederick realizes his mistake. He'd tried to run this battle like an exercise, like he was drilling troops. When they'd come upon the Austrians, they could have simply charged into the smaller, unready army, but instead, he'd formed up, putting his grenadiers between his cavalry, like the great Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus did in the Thirty Years' War a formation that would let the infantry murder cavalry with shots before his own mounted troops could countercharge. A battle plan out of a history book. It isn't working. Instead, the Austrian horse crashes into the right wing of his army and envelops it. His cavalry are standing still when the charge connects. The units mix in a battle of swords and pistols. And Frederick's in the thick of the fighting. It's confused and bloody. There's driving snow and fog. And both sides have white uniforms. The Prussian infantry and artillery keeps firing into their own ranks, mistaking comrades for the enemy, and the Prussian cavalry are starting to rout. Oh, Gustavus Adolphus, he thinks. Oh God, this is how Gustavus Adolphus died, mixed with the enemy, lost in fog. Suddenly, a man grabs his reins. It's his general. He tells Frederick to flee the field. The battle seems lost, and if he falls, Prussia will too, for he has no heir. So Frederick turns his great charger and bolts toward the nearest town. And he doesn't see that behind him, while his cavalry has broken, the well-drilled Prussian infantry starts to move across the field like solid walls, firing in steady volleys, driving off the Austrian cavalry attack. It is Frederick's first battle, and he's running away. But his infantry, the great gift from his father, will stand and fight. Oh man, Zoe, what a cliffhanger. You know, I don't think I'm gonna be able to wait a whole week to find out what happens to Fritz and his army. <coughs> nah, too expensive. I'm still paying off that trip to West Point for eggnog. 
But you know what is super affordable? Getting to see every Extra History episode a whole week early over on Nebula. That is right, friendos. Our little creator-owned and operated independent streaming service that could, that I am so damn proud to be a part of, by the way, just got actually better because now we and a bunch of our creator friends are ramping up a new feature called Nebula First. And how it works is, thanks to the support that we get from Nebula, we can now produce all of our episodes of Extra History faster than we ever could and then release them a full week early over on Nebula. So along with catching all of our Frederick the Great episodes early, right? You could also be seeing videos from just a ton of other cool folks like Movies with Mikey, Foreign Man in a Foreign Land, and jet lag all way earlier than you would be able to on YouTube with Nebula First. And that's on top of being able to watch all videos, including ours, without ads like, you know, this one, and the ever-growing list of just awesome Nebula originals over there. Case in point, I just watched Lindsay Ellis's new video essay called We Don't Talk About E.T., which not only is a very true title, by the way, but it is a fun and insightful look at the cultural impact of everyone's favorite Reese's Pieces fiend 40 years later. 40 years? Jeez, my bones are turning to dust just thinking about that. But swinging back to what's important here, we can actually talk about my favorite part now, because I'm gonna walk you through how to get all of that goodness and more for less than $15 for an entire year. Okay, first things first. You go to my link in the description, it's right down there, you'll see it, which is actually going to take you to CuriosityStream, who's partnered with us over on Nebula. Then once you're there, what you're gonna do is select the cheapest annual plan and sign up using my code extra credits. Please don't forget that part, thank you in advance. Now, it won't say it on there, but I promise you, if you do the above steps and use my code at checkout, you're going to get a shiny new email from Nebula into your inbox saying that your Nebula account has been activated. Meaning what just happened was that you got access to Nebula home of just a ton of smart creators releasing early and original videos, and CuriosityStream, the best place for thousands of big-budget documentaries and non-fiction titles, for crazy cheap. All in less than five minutes, and again, for less than 15 bucks a year. Honestly, I'm not sure how that is exactly possible, but I'm not gonna question it, because it really is just a great way to see the best content this old series of tubes has to offer you that also directly helps out our channel at the same time. So let me be the first to welcome you to the Nebula First experience, because I think think you are really going to enjoy it here. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 